Hi, everybody. My name is Jared Yates Saxton. I'm the author of American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World But Failed Its People. I'm also the co-host of the Muckrake Podcast, and here on this channel, I host a weekly Sunday night at 8 p.m. Eastern show that I call Bourbon Talk, where I like to open up a bottle of bourbon and talk about what's going on at the moment and uh, take questions from viewers. I hope maybe someday you'll join me over there. You might also be familiar with my work over on Twitter, where I'm at JY Sexton. Uh, I'm writing a lot about what is going on with Trumpism, what, what we're facing in growing fascism and authoritarianism, uh, our history, the hidden history of America that most of us don't even know. And what I wanted to do was open it up a little bit. Over on Twitter, I'm restraining down to, what, 280 characters per tweet. I want to get deeper in the weeds. And as a professor, uh, sort of my home turf is the dry erase board and the dry erase marker. So I wanted to start to get really in depth and really talk about the nature of what it is that we are facing right now. I tell everyone who will listen, the first step in beating back fascism and growing authoritarianism and disinformation and propaganda is to get educated because we have been fed a lifetime worth of lies. We have been fed a mythology that has absolutely nothing to do with reality, and it has been constructed, and it has been revised, and it has been focused, and it's an incredible weapon. And it's meant to keep us in the dark about the truth and the threats that we face. I want to go ahead and, and take an opportunity to try and start dismantling that one brick at a time. And uh, so we're going to have a uh, reoccurring lecture series here based off my book, American Rule, and going even further than that book allowed me to go. So let's go ahead and let's get started. And the first thing that we have to talk about is the idea of American exceptionalism. I'm sure at some point in your life that you've come across this concept. The idea that America is the hero of the world, that there's something special about America, the uh, shining city on the hill, the inspiration to the rest of the world, right? We're the, one, the cavalry that comes in during a war and saves everybody. And there's just something about America. There's something inherent about America that makes it good and right. Let's go ahead and give it a, give it a definition. American exceptionalism is a religious and nationalist myth that America was ordained by God to carry out his will. It is a supernatural concept. And when you hear all of these speeches that are all about, I don't know, eagles flying and flags rippling in the wind and it's full of all the, these symbols and ideas, we're really talking about a supernatural idea. The idea that God somehow or another in heaven or wherever you want to believe that, that this deity exists, that that he or she or they or whoever, and in this case, it's a patriarchal God, because that's one of the ways to control society and control women, looks down on the earth and says, that country right there is my chosen country, and this country is going to be the champion of the universe. It's the fate of humanity that rests on what America does. Now, Maybe this is inspirational. I mean, certainly people have rallied around this idea for generations. I mean, it's gotten a lot of presidents elected and a lot of people in Congress. Made a lot of people a lot of money, too. Let's just be honest about it. But it's a really dangerous concept. And the reason it's a dangerous concept is because it launders U.S. actions and makes them heroic. Now, that would be fine if maybe it was, I don't know, cutting a corner or two or, you know, which side of a war or a conflict we're on. But here's where it gets really bad. 
Because we have the idea that America is exceptional and that it's chosen by God for some reason to carry out the will of the universe and everything that it does is heroic, all of a sudden it legitimizes slavery of generations upon generations of African Americans. It legitimizes the genocide of the native people. It legitimizes wars, many of which are immoral, unethical, some of them even illegal, plus also exploitation. Chances are, if you're watching this video, you've been exploited in your job or in your life. Your family has been exploited, but it goes even deeper than that. The idea that America is the arbiter of the will of the universe and right and wrong passes through the lens of American interest has created many a sweatshop around the world. It's kept many people impoverished. It's kept many people in dangerous situations. It's led to genocides around the world. It's led to overthrowing democratically elected leaders in other countries. It's led to innocent people dying in bombing runs and attacks on enemies, right? The enemies of this exceptional idea. So this right here is the operating mythology that has animated America for generations. It started from the very beginning, and we'll get into that in the next lecture. But for right now, let's just go ahead and look at the fact that this is a myth. It's not real. It is a, a story that tries to explain things that have happened while also going ahead and longer, laundering U.S. actions. This is one of the most dangerous things that has ever been created, and it is the root of our current crisis. So let's go ahead and let's talk about where the idea of exceptionalism and God-chosen nations, where it comes from. All right, so what we've actually seen here is that U.S. political history has merged with Christian mythology. We're not talking about other gods here. We're talking about God, the God of the Christian faith. The idea that the Christian God of the Holy Bible looked down on the United States and ordained it, handed down his will, handed down his desire and belief that America should be the champion. Now, this has a lot of background, and it comes from the idea of something called divine agents. In the Christian mythology, and this goes back actually to its Jewish heritage, there is the idea that God from on high will often act through people to establish change or to lead humanity in a certain direction. This is how you have prophets. This is how you have saints. You have martyrs, those types of ideas, right? Uh, and and we've, had some, we've had some instances of these divine agents, right? We've had in the Bible, of course, we have King David, who was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Neither was Paul. And then one of the most famous instances ever, and I've been really interested in this guy lately in my research, Constantine. Constantine, of course, was the ancient Roman emperor who decided that Christianity should be allowed in the empire. Uh, there's a famous myth that he converted before a big giant war and made everybody put crosses on his shields. Turns out that's not real. That's not actually how it went down because obviously we're talking about a mythology. But Constantine was considered like a godly figure, this flawed king who was worked through by God in order to carry out his will. Funny thing about Constantine, after he converted, after he built a bunch of churches in ancient Rome, after he established this power structure in the name of God, uh, I don't know, he then went and executed his son and his wife. And then, you know, he got baptized and then he died, and then every Christian agent then went out and said, Constantine was totally holy. He was basically another Christ on earth, 
okay? So this is the concept of the divine agent. It's one of the reasons, by the way, before we get ahead of ourselves, that a lot of Christians believe that Donald Trump was chosen by God to be their warrior, or some of them believe that he's a messiah. But that's another lecture for another day. Real fast, let's go ahead and talk about another concept. You might have heard the name St. Augustine before. St. Augustine is considered one of the most influential uh, uh, Christian leaders of all time. And after the Roman Empire fell apart, and remember that this was an empire that was chosen by God, right? Because Constantine went ahead and made it a Christian empire. So Rome falls, and then the question is, well, what happened there? right? Why would the country that was chosen by God, why would it fail? Why would it falter? And this was one of the things that St. Augustine worked through in his piece, City of God, which was written not too long after the fall of Rome. And so St. Augustine was one of those philosophers of the Christian faith. He spent a lot of time sort of you know, working out the, the ideological, philosophical underpinnings of Christianity that would eventually animate the faith. So in the city of God, St. Augustine comes along and he says that God uses people and nations as agents for his will. Think about this. We have the idea of divine agents, people who can be prophets, people who can be martyrs, people who can be leaders, and yeah, they can be animated by God. But St. Augustine looks at the Roman Empire, which is just in a lot of trouble at this point. Rome has been sacked, a lot of issues are going on. And he opens this up, and he says, you know what? God uses nations in the same way that he uses people. He was using Rome as his chosen empire to make things go, right? To, to make sure that all of this stuff falls into place so that God's will can be done. Now, we've done St. Augustine, we've talked about the, the, the Holy Bible tradition of this. Let's talk about one more person. Let's talk about Plato. Now, Plato's most famous work, The Republic, is all about how to order a society, how nations are supposed to work, how we're supposed to share the world, and, and how we sort of navigate those things. Well, Plato in the Republic comes up with something that he terms the noble lie, all right? The noble lie he supposes would be the perfect way to organize a society, the best way to structure a society. And tell me if this sounds familiar, okay? The idea of the noble lie is that, I don't know, let's say it's a nation designed slash ordained by God. Sound familiar? Okay, so it's not enough that it's just like a group of people. There has to be something on high that comes down and gives it legitimacy, right? So it's a nation that's designed and ordained by God. There's also a chosen few. And Plato says these would be like a specific race that is dipped in gold. Everyone knows that they're the most important and they're the most capable. Uh, I don't know, the wealthy, the rich, white people, but however you want to, you know, chalk that up. There's this, this higher echelon, right? But in order to keep everybody else in line, you have to convince them of a working meritocracy. A meritocracy is a system in which, yeah, it's stratis stratified and hierarchical, but, you know, if you do good work and if you work hard enough and if you're talented enough, you will be recognized and you will be lifted up in the ranks and you will join the chosen few. These mythologies that we're talking about right here form the basis of modern society. The noble lie of America is exceptionalism. And ever since that this was put in place with the founding of the country, uh, it's been used by politicians, businessmen, uh, demagogues to go ahead and quell dissent, quiet critics. You know, if you, I don't know, say that America could be better than it is, they could almost answer you, well, what's your problem with America? 
are you a traitor? Why don't you love America? Love it or leave it, right? Well, under the idea that this was ordained by God, then America is as good as it can get, and why should you ever question the divine plan of God, right? And so what we've seen here again is that all of these atrocities of slavery, genocide, oppression, the undermining of, of democratically elected leaders, wars, human suffering, all of this stuff gets filtered through the idea of there's a larger plan, right? This thing has been designed and ordained. And if you're not in the chosen few, then obviously you're sinful, right? Which is something, by the way, that St. Augustine spent a lot of time with, which was, well, maybe the Roman Empire didn't succeed because we weren't godly enough. And maybe we need to show more faith. So where does that get us? What does the idea of American exceptionalism do for us? And why is this currently putting us in a dangerous moment of crisis? Well, here's the, the, the truth, and this isn't fun. We're in a moment of decline. I assume you can feel that. It's part of the reason we feel demoralized and we feel panicked is because the America that maybe we got raised up believing in feels like it's slipping through our fingertips. It feels like it's a mirage that we can never touch. Here's the truth of why we're in a moment of decline. We're in a moment of decline because of a lot of really piss poor decisions. We're in a moment of decline because the wealthy and powerful have constructed a system of control and inequality. Uh, we have a top-down economic system in which we get scraps while the wealthy and the powerful become more wealthy and more powerful. It's completely unfair. But on top of that, it's not sustainable, nor does it really work. Actually, our economy has shown throughout history that whenever we embrace this sort of top-down economy, it always crashes because it's unsustainable. It's ridiculous. It's an insane concept. So... We've also had this redistribution of wealth from the people to what you would call the military-industrial complex. The idea that America is exceptional means that America needs to determine for the rest of the world how it behaves, what it does, and how it operates. That means that our military needs to be constantly on the move, like a bunch of crusaders, and that they need to go around and make sure that American interests are served. And by the way, you guessed it, a lot of the times those American interests are not necessarily political or social, they're economic and corporate, right? We're also in a moment of decline because, I don't know, we had a bunch of forever wars that drained our money, our treasure, uh, the lives of our soldiers, plus also hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world. The cost of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and the dozens of operations, many of which we don't even know about or are hidden behind a bunch of red tape, have drained our resources, have hurt our, uh, our reputation in the world, they've cost us political capital, and they've also kept us in a state of austerity. We don't have a lot of resources anymore. We can't invest in education, we can't invest in our infrastructure, we can't invest in healthcare or housing or even defense. We can't attack a pandemic or even save ourselves from a pandemic. We know right now that we are on the verge of a climate catastrophe, but we can't marshal our resources or come together. We're rudderless. We're falling apart, to be honest. And by the way, it just came out, what, yesterday, that the President of the United States, a self-proclaimed billionaire, pays like $750 in taxes. Our corporations and our wealthy don't pay their share. As a result, the coffers start to run thin. We can't live like this any longer, and we're in a moment of decline. But here's the problem. American exceptionalism is incompatible with this idea. Why? A big question. If we are chosen by an almighty, all-powerful, omnipotent God to carry out his will, if we are an exceptional country, if we're a special country, if we are a divine agent, how could we fail? 
How could that country, that empire, that has been chosen by a deity, how could that possibly ever enter into a moment of decline? This right here, the incompatibility of American exceptionalism and the fact that America is in an obvious decline. And by the way, people around the world know it. And even Americans are waking up to it. I think Donald Trump has made us very aware that something isn't right. The incompatibility of this is a problem. And here's the reason why. Collapsing myths of exceptionalism breed fascism. So here's the sad truth. We haven't done a very good job of understanding fascism, and in part because it's a lot easier to just hold it out as this sort of nebulous, dark enemy that we defeated in World War II. It's a lot easier to believe that fascism is an aberration and phenomenon of the 20th century in Western Europe. It's not. It's the dark side of human nature, and it can happen literally anywhere. America has come so close to being swallowed by fascism in the past. And the fact that you don't know about that is further proof of the propaganda of our history. It's happened time and time and time again. And when that myth of exceptionalism starts to falter, the incompatibility of except, the myth of exceptionalism in a failing, declining nation leads to a fascistic opportunity. So here's what ends up happening. Fascist, right? They weaponize nostalgia. They tell you, oh, I don't know. America used to be great, and it could be great again. But we're on the wrong track right now. And part of the reason is because, oh, you people, you suckers, believe we're in decline. We're not in decline. We're just getting started. Or, I don't know, standing at the RNC and yelling, the best is yet to come. I could have gone louder on that, but I, you know, I thought about the people who have their uh, volume up. They talk about a version of their country that never existed. The fascists created this vision of Italy and Germany, and then neo-fascists created these nostalgias for a time that never actually existed. That's what, uh, that's what Donald Trump is doing with Trumpism. That's what Make America Great Again is. While weaponizing nostalgia, they use conspiracy theories. And this is the explanation that tells us why we could possibly fail. The conspiracy theory says this, the exceptional country is so exceptional and so important in the plan of the divine and the good that there's a conspiracy against it. And oftentimes it's a supernatural conspiracy. There's a reason why QAnon talks about satanic pedophiles. There's a reason why they talk about dark energies and dark magic. This has been done since there were civilizations. If you actually look back in ancient Rome, they were doing the exact same thing then, okay? This is part of human communication and human politics. So they say, the only reason that the country is failing is because there are people who are plotting against us, right? Now, these conspiracy theories involve outsiders, Oftentimes, these are puppet masters. This is an anti-Semitic code word, obviously, because they believe in, like, Jewish cabals and all of this stuff. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, that kind of stuff. They also believe in traitors. That's people inside of America who are intentionally weakening, weakening America. Donald Trump does this all the time, right? He says that these trade deals... They were done on purpose, that it was done on purpose to hurt America. The idea that Hillary Clinton has sold out America time and again in order to pad her wealth and her power. There are people working on the inside with the people on the outside. And then there are the ignorant agents. By the way, in case you haven't caught on yet, what we're talking about is a white supremacist worldview. The ignorant agent is almost always a person of color. 
the idea is that they can't fend for themselves. They can't tell truth from, from uh, lies. So they are always vulnerable to manipulation from the outsiders and the traitors, right? This goes back to the founding of our country. It goes back to the Civil War. It goes back to the Civil Rights era. And so what we see here is this triumvirate, right, of a conspiracy. These groups endanger us because they're not up to the level of us, the in-group, which is almost always a white supremacist framing. So what's happening here is that the exceptional country has been under attack by this conspiracy, all right? Now, what ends up happening with this? Fascist demands power to confront the conspiracy and to use preemptive violence. There's a crisis, damn it. There's something that the fascist authoritarian leader needs to take care of. There's this conspiracy theory. It is a terrorist plot against the country that the fascist authoritarian demands the power to deal with. Also, this idea of preemptive violence is absolutely crucial. We know that there's a conspiracy. These people are meeting in private to take us over, to destroy us, to kill us, to take your family, to ruin your life, take everything that you have earned, everything you have fought for. And if we don't do something about it first, I don't know, are we waiting for the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud? Are we waiting on Antifa to roll into your town and kill you and institute uh, Sharia law or whatever the hell they're making up this week? This is all based on the incompatibility of the moment of decline and exceptionalism. Now, I want to say this. This isn't, again, this isn't meant to be alarmist. This isn't meant to be provocative. Trumpism is fascism. It is a religious cult that worships the mythology of the country. It, it, it worships this fake alternate reality America, this American exceptional idea that has led to slavery and genocide and oppression. What we're watching right now is the beginnings of a fascist state. What fascists do is they have their own reality, and if you don't get on board with that reality, they will either intimidate you into believing that reality, they will meet you with violence to force you into that reality, and if you don't relent, and if you don't say that 2 plus 2 equals 5, even though you know it equals 4, they'll kill you or disappear you. That is what fascism is. It isn't just necessarily ethnic cleansing, although ethnic cleansing is often a feature of it. It isn't exactly a complete takeover of laws, but that is often a tool and a cudgel that is used. Fascism is a war with reality. It is this moment where the myth of exceptionalism and the declining nation meet, and they allow fascists to gain power. There are a lot of reasons why people refuse to accept this fact. It's terrifying. This is a really frightening moment. Uh, many people have every reason to believe the status quo will hold Donald Trump accountable. We've seen this for years. He'll be held in by democratic institutions. There are adults in the room, right? Oh, just wait and see when the courts keep him in order. The problem is that fascists and authoritarians, they just chew through democratic institutions left and right. And the reason that they're able to is this decline. The laws, the precedents, and the constitutions, those are all social constructs. They are only as powerful as our ability to protect them and our willingness to protect them. As we go into a moment of decline, we lose faith in those institutions. We're not going to stand up for them. Then meanwhile, a fascist like Donald Trump, an authoritarian like Donald Trump, just eats his way through the diseased tissue. The problem is that this has happened multiple times around the world in this exact same cycle, and that America has come to the brink of this multiple times. That is both frightening, but it should also be hopeful, because we've beaten it back. We've had moments where literal Nazis like Charles Lindbergh started to gain political momentum and clout, and we beat them, and we figured out a better way forward. This series is going to dive into that stuff. 
we're going to dive in to how this system was constructed, how this entire alternate reality was built, how it has kept us in check this entire time. We're going to learn about history that you haven't learned about in the past because that history was specifically authored and created and revised and focused in order to keep you from understanding a lot of the stuff that we're talking about right now. This is meant to be an alternative to Trumpism and this so-called patriotic education. Patriotic education is just fascistic re-education. What we're talking about and what we're going to be diving into with this series of lectures is the honest to God truth. There's nothing about this that is alarmist or made up or fabricated. Patriotic education is about denying this and using force and intimidation and the educational system as a means of indoctrination. That's the route that we're going on. And I can tell you, Donald Trump is inherently a fascist and Donald Trump is inherently an authoritarian. It's who he is. And he has told us on so many occasions what he plans to do and what he doesn't plan to do. When he says that he's not going to uh, lead to a peaceful transfer of power, he means it. When he tells you that maybe he'll be president for another 12 years, he means it. All right? We have reached a point in this country where we are in a moment of great existential political crisis. And we need to recognize it. And when we get educated and when we get angry and we get when we get organized, which all of this, by the way, is meant to dissolve the bonds of community and the bonds of society. This system as it's constructed is meant to divide us. It's meant to keep us from one another. It's meant to keep us from trusting one another. It's meant to think that the other people that we can join with and find some solidarity and intimacy and love and connection with are our enemies and that they will betray us and they will use us. And this entire system is dog eat dog. And you should never even talk to anybody and you should never use your rights because an authoritarian wants a society where you have your rights, but you don't want to use them for fear and because of apathy and powerlessness. We're gonna work against that. So I hope that you will consider sharing this, letting people know about this. Uh, we're gonna get really in depth on some stuff. And this is not partisan, all right? We, like we're going to lay the blame where blame, blame lays. And there is a lot to go around, all right? The Democratic Party helped set up an entire structure of oppression. And later on, they changed size and the Republicans filled that vacuum. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to get into those things. This is not partisan. We're dealing with history. We're dealing with truth. So I hope you'll share this. Even with some people who might not necessarily be welcome to it, they need to understand because this system of fascism that is starting to take place in America, it's not good for them either. They may think that they're winning. They th may think that Donald Trump is a champion who's on their side. He's not. He's on his own side. He's there to increase his own wealth and his own power. People need to wake up and realize that the left, right, blue, red dynamic isn't real. It's been created to divide us and keep us from talking to one another and recognizing the real truth of how we got here. So please, if you will, share, like, subscribe, all that stuff. We're going to keep doing more. In fact, in our next episode, we're going to go back to the very beginning of America. We're going to look at the Constitutional Convention, which uh, luckily for us, Founding Father James Madison uh, took extensive notes. Got some bad news for you. He didn't think too highly of us. And by us, I mean common people. Because the United States government was created, and our economy was created, and our system of laws was created to advantage the wealthy and powerful, and to keep the rest of us under control, and to keep us believing in this myth of American exceptionalism. Because when you believe that America is ordained by God or has some sort of larger spiritual mission, you don't question things. You just trust it. Because the noble lie is powerful, and it keeps people in line, and it keeps people from threatening the, the structure of power that holds them down. So, again, uh, if you haven't yet, please go out and get a copy of American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World But Failed Its People. Uh, it'll make a nice companion to this lecture series. And remember to share this with people who uh, it might help, because uh, I have to tell you, the, the truth is going to set us free. All right. Thanks, everyone.